Today, what's happening with interest rates? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm joined by Steve Mickenbacker from Canstar. Hello Steve. Hello Martin. Great to have you with us and uh, you guys do a lot of analysis about interest rates and you know what's going up, what's going down, so I thought we should have a conversation about that given all of the moves, movements recently. But I guess a good place to start is how do you get your data? Oh, look, we are the interest rate geeks and we love data. And, and what we, we, we get most of it directly from the providers. So, you know, we've got, you know, we have 90% of almost every finance market around. We, we get as much of the market as we possibly can. And we have arrangements with the providers so that when they make a rate change, they give us the rate change and we get it straight onto the website on the due date. Uh, so it comes from the providers and it's very timely. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a great resource. Yeah, absolutely. And one question I have there, there is sometimes a difference between the advertised rate, you know, the, the rate that's there on the website, and actually the final rate that people could negotiate to. I'm assuming you've got the, um, you know, the official rates rather than the negotiated rates. Yeah, we do, Martin, because what, what we, we start with the premise that if uh, an organisation should be advertising a good competitive rate, uh, if you've got to sort of twist arms and uh, jump up and down, and prove up to be a, an expert negotiator to get a good rate. Well, you know what, most of us aren't that. Uh, so we use the advertised rate and say, that's what's available to most people. Yeah, and it's interesting, of course, because the Productivity Commission last week, uh, last year, I should say, made the point that in fact, the advertised rate, the publicly available rate, and the final rate that you might be able to get is quite different. But it does, as you say, depend on your ability to be able to push and shove and uh, and, and basically tw you know twist the lender's arms. And some people are better than that, and others. Yeah, yeah. So, well, some people just don't have that skill set, and yeah. some people are embarrassed by having to negotiate. And Australians aren't sort of natural negotiators. We go to stores and pay the price. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of people think, well, home loans are the same. And of course, they're not. Yeah, absolutely, which is sometimes why they use brokers. Anyway, you you publish data, I think, pretty much every week, certainly. you know, I've, It's just the latest has come into my inbox. And it's Telling quite an interesting story. So perhaps we could go through the major categories. So let's start with home loans. What are you seeing there at the moment? Look, home loans are competition, competition, competition. Everyone wants to build market share and in some cases rebuild market share. So we're seeing rates coming down all the time. And of course, in March, we saw two rate cuts and you'd expect to see uh, interest rate reductions during rate cuts. But we're seeing, look, dozens of movements every week. Um, Interestingly, the last week was one of the quieter ones we've had. But, uh, but we're seeing dozens of movements every week. They're all in one direction. They're all down. Uh, and uh, fixed rates in particular are coming down very quickly. Uh, one of the interesting things we've seen, though, since the beginning of March, is that the biggest cuts have come from the big four lenders. Mm. Now, that's really new because they've been prepared to sit back and let others be the lead the market down while they uh, took advantage of, uh, of the, the incumbent rates. Well, they've actually now entered the fray and uh, the best rates, the best and biggest cuts they've made are bigger than those that are coming from uh, the non-banks and the smaller uh, banks and, and uh, ADIs. So that's quite a change. That's, uh, that says, look, we as a group are looking to repair some of our lost market share. Absolutely, and gaining market share, and of course they've also been helped by the financing sources via the, the Reserve Bank and, and other things too. So in a way, their margins are a little bit protected from where they were, but it is pretty yeah. pretty aggressive out there. Um, one of the interesting questions I get a lot is people looking at the fixed rates and thinking, oh, they look pretty good relative to the variable rate, which may go up, may go down later. But there are some tricks, aren't there, and things you've got to be aware of if you actually are looking at the fixed rates. Hey, look, absolutely. We, we say to people all the time about the home loan, the best way to create long-term wealth is to get your loans paid off early so that then you can concentrate your energies on a long-term wealth strategy. Now, getting your home loan repaid early is the thing you might have to give up in some sense uh, if you fix the rate. Uh, you, uh, most loans these days, most fixed-rate loans these days, allow you to make extra repayments 
but you're capped in how much extra you can repay. Uh, plenty of them have offset accounts, but you're capped into how much uh, can be in the offset account. Uh, if you choose to repay the loan early, even by necessity, um, you could be up for quite a big exit cost by way of an economic cost, uh, which I can explain in a minute if, the, if we like. Um, uh, so you're giving up a degree of flexibility. Now, it's not as bad as it was you know, 15 years ago, but you're still giving up a degree of flexibility. You might not be able to get the repaid loan repaid earlier, and, uh, and that holds you back financially. Yeah, and you touch on the economic cost. We should talk about that because basically yeah. what it means is if you do want to switch later, they basically mark that loan to market relative to what interest rates have actually done, and you could be up for quite a big cost. Yeah, you can be, and, and it can be a big, big cost. You know, for a reasonably average loan, you could be up for $20,000 easily. Now, it depends, of course. If rates go down, uh, you can be up for a cost. If rates go up, you're unlikely to be up for an economic cost. Now, what, it does, what it's about is that lenders, if, if you decide to fix your loan, lenders lock away funding to, for your loan. It's done on a portfolio basis, of course, but nevertheless, that's the simplicity of it. If you're going three-year fixed, the lender locks away a three-year deposit or some sort of loan fundraising to fund your loan. Now, if rates go down, uh, they're still locked into that, even if you choose to get out of the loan. And that's what the economic cost is about, compensating them for the fact that they've lost your higher price loan but they still have to pay the higher funding cost for it for the extra year or two years of the uh, of that period. Mm. Uh, you end up paying that if you want to get out of the loan earlier. Yeah, and I sometimes say to people, you know, the thing about a fixed rate is it's a fixed rate, so you know what you're up for. But the problem with the fixed rate, it's a fixed rate. <laughs> and if rates yeah. move against you, <laughs> you could lose well, out. So, so it's about, yeah. you know, insurance on one hand in terms of um, rates moving against you versus the economic cost if it moves the other way. It is tricky. Look, it is tricky. But I, I think fixed rates, fixed rates are dangerous if you're nervous about what will happen in the future. You know, will I for some reason have to sell the house early and get out of the loan? That's where you should be nervous about going into fixed rates. Uh, now is a time of considerable uncertainty. So plenty of people might say, look, now's not the right time for me. Uh, but the, the general thing with fixed rates is, look, don't make out that you're the greatest interest rate investor and speculator of all time. If we were all that, we'd be multi-billionaires and wouldn't have to worry about this. Fixed rates are all about saying, today, I know I can afford to make a repayment of $2,000 every month. Uh, if I can lock that in for the next three years, I'll feel a lot more comfortable about my financial future. Uh, now, if, if, that's, if you use that attitude about fixed rates, you stop worrying about will the market keep going down? Uh, have I picked the bottom? Will I be, uh, have rate envy in, in 12 months' time because someone's doing better? Forget all that. It's about locking in a rate uh, so that you're locking your repayment. Yep. Now that's good advice, I think, Steve. Now let's switch to credit cards because um, you could be forgiven for thinking that interest rates have not moved at all if you look at the cash rate because credit card rates are still where they were. We have seen um, an avalanche of, of rate changes in home loans over, over recent times uh, and even since the RBA's cash rate moved uh, and even before that. Um, uh, credit cards have not followed that path. In the last month, we've seen one rate reduction. Uh, so credit cards have not done that. They haven't done that for years. Uh, credit cards haven't moved much at all since uh, the pre-GFC interest rate levels up uh, where home loans were up around 8%. Uh, so home loans might have come down 6 7%. Uh, credit cards really haven't much at all. There have been a, new, a few new uh, low rate offerings coming on the market, but the interest rates have not moved much at all. Yeah, and that tells you something about uh, where the banks may be squirreling away a little profit, right? In other words, trading off the higher margin on the credit cards vis-a-vis -vis the very low margins on the mortgages to try and actually get, get new business. But Look, that's what... absolutely right. And, and the problem with it is that people uh, look at home loans and realise, well, look, it's $400,000 I'm, I'm borrowing here. I need to get a good rate. Whereas credit cards, they're not quite as sensitive. They see it as part of everyday life. Uh, they get used to paying too much. And they don't look to negotiate that. They're not looking for the right deal. And unfortunately, we have people locked into 
uh, uh, the top end platinum cards with it paying over 20% interest uh, and earning rewards, but uh, they might have be rolling $10,000 worth of debt uh, month in, month out, and it's costing them a bomb. Uh, so get into the right card if you must have a debt on your credit card. <laughs> yes, I have to say that I always try and avoid having anything on my credit card because it's way too expensive. If you pay off every month, then effectively you win and the bank doesn't. Even the low rate cards are high mm. debt. Uh, and they're also bad debt in the sense that uh, they're not adding to your long term financial well being. Uh, so, you know, if you've got credit card debt, Work out a way to get it down and pay it off. Balance transfers can help provide, provide you have lots of discipline that you spend. But get out of credit card debt. Yeah, that's good advice there too. Now let's talk about deposits next because, of course, there are 3 million or their households in Australia who rely on deposit income. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. they're being taken to the cleaners, aren't they? Look, they have been the long-suffering group for ages for, for years now we, we've been having um, interest rate cuts now for almost two years reserve bank cuts but the savings rates were coming down for about a year before that even happened there's been just this long-term gradual decline and for people living off their incomes their fixed incomes this is a really tough time and it's not uh, they've, they've they've become used to it they've just uh, you know every, every morning they wake up and they dread getting another pay cut Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, rates have been on the grind down and down to the point where the base rate on online savings accounts is down to 0.05%. 0.05. I mean, that is just nothing. Um, so that's the base rate. And it means that people can no longer stick money into the online savings account and say, we'll leave it there. It's not a bad rate. You know, it'll be okay. You can't do that anymore. You've got to work your savings very, very hard to get a reasonable return. Hmm. And some of the term rates are a little better than that, but not hugely so. Yeah, look, the, 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 um, they're not hugely so. You can get up towards 2%, uh, but not quite 2% at the moment, but you can get up towards it. Uh, back in mid-March, when the, the cash rate was moved as part of that emergency action by the Reserve Bank, the big banks came out with a package of things that they would do. And one of them was that they put in place uh, some... Um, Term deposit relief, if you like. So they said, look, 1.7, 1.75 will pay as a term deposit rate for 12 months or 10 months. And uh, and that's doing our bit for that part of our customer base. Well, hate to say it, but all of those specials are gone and forgotten. And uh, now if you with one of the big banks, you'll only be earning 1.35%, 1.3% on a term deposit. So those jolly nice days were very short lived. They lasted about two months at most. Yeah, and it still pays to chop around because there are some variations. But as you say, those little uh, little bonuses that were there have just pretty much disappeared now. Look, they have. Um, the other the other game you can play is the online savings account, taking advantage of those uh, promotional uh, introductory rates. And look, Macquarie have two point six five at the moment. So um, so you know if. You, Provided you're prepared to move your money after four months and try to find the, the next little avenue, try another provider, uh, you can still earn a rate that's sort of looking, you know, half sensible. Um, but uh, but you do have to work. You know, you've got to either got to move it around or you've got to find a bonus account where you can meet the conditions every month. Um, or you just try to manage the term deposit maturities as best you can. Yeah. Yes, I'm afraid that it's not easy. And then finally, let's just talk about personal loans because that's quite an interesting area. It's not a very large segment of the market, but in fact, given the current uh, environment with people perhaps uh, struggling with you know, financial pressures, um, personal loans might be worth considering. Look, they, they are. The beauty of personal loans, and what I like about them, is that they can be the escape hatch for people to get out of trouble. You know, if you find that you cannot control a credit card, you get yourself in a credit card, uh, debt that you can't seem to clear, maybe it's time to just cut up the card and, uh, and talk to a personal lender about putting in place a repayment program that will get you out of trouble in a couple of years. So personal loans are a pretty good avenue for that. And I'd like to see um, what we've seen over recent years, and that is that rates have been coming down. And uh, you, can, you can actually uh, buy a personal loan now for 3.15% interest rate. 5.75, 5.99. So they've come down, even though credit cards haven't. Uh, so as, as, as home loans have come down, so have credit, 
uh, you know, personal loans. They used to be the uh, the the strength of the the customer owned segment and our credit unions and building societies still are to a degree. But what we've seen is new entrants coming in. Uh, you know the, the Harmony Society ones, Money Place uh, Rate uh, Setter, all those sort of new entrants who are quasi um, uh, peer f- funders, um, but uh, but providing personal loans now. At, uh, the difference that's, that's, that's really developed in the industry is that people are pricing for risk. Uh, and um, uh, if you are a low-risk customer but still need credit, uh, you can get some of these very low rates. Uh, higher rates, of course, though, at the other end of the spectrum. But we've certainly seen some nice downward movement, which must be helping uh, people who do just want to reduce their debt, get onto a repayment program and get themselves clear. Yeah, and it's worth saying, in my mind, those are a better bet than, say, the payday loans or other short-term lending where the interest oh. rates are just astronomical. Oh, they're totally astronomical. Um, and uh, and you just do not want to go down that avenue. That is the absolute last resort. Mm. And uh, and if you get to that point, you find yourself on that treadmill, you'll just keep running, running, running and never catch up. Yeah. So you can't go that route. You try every other avenue you talk to all sorts of people about whether you qualify with them even if you end up paying one of the top end rates these sort of lenders it's way below those payday rates uh, and the other thing to look out for in in in, in payday loans or, or or any other form of lending but uh, but i'm partic- particularly thinking of uh, buy now pay later schemes is uh, the fees will rack up if you don't pay them back on time because they also end up astronomical yeah, well, I think those buy now, pay later um, offers look very alluring because they're so simple and straightforward. And as you say, if you pay them all off as per the structure, it's okay. But if you miss a single one, boy, they start hitting you, don't they? Oh, they do. You can end up paying away 25%. So on $200, you can pay $50 in fees. Now, that means you've missed payment after payment after payment. But unfortunately, some people do get themselves in that position. Uh, the, the, the key with all of this, this whole credit space, is don't borrow money you don't have. <laughs> I think that's a very, very good point on which to uh, draw our conversation to a, clo- a close, Steve, insofar that credit is there, and if you use it wisely and carefully, it can be advantageous. But unfortunately, there are many people who just dig themselves such a deep, deep hole and then find it really hard to get out again. Absolutely, I'm in favour of credit because credit can make, enable you to do things that really matter to your life and improve your life, uh, but you have to make sure it's credit that you can pay in a reasonable time frame yeah. and then get clear of yep. And shop around and go to sites like CanStar to get the information on because there you can see all the different providers, all the different rates, shop around and uh, you will see some quite surprising differences between perhaps uh, different lenders that you wouldn't otherwise expect to see. Yeah, look, uh, it's nice to be able to do it all in one place. It wasn't possible in the past. And the enabler of technology is wonderful because you can borrow from somebody in a different part of the world that you've never even heard of before. Uh, uh, And provided you get a good deal and uh, get the flexibility that you need to actually get out of of debt faster, uh, then uh, it's a great world to be in. (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. Digitalization has its advantage. Steve, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for walking us through that. I'll put a link to the uh, uh, the site there below and uh, hopefully uh, people will go have a look and uh, see whether they can find some better rates. Thanks, Martin. I enjoyed that. Pleased to talk to you. Thank you. Take care.